All right, good evening. Go ahead and grab your seats. And uh, we're going to dive into Revelation chapter 18. So let me pray, and, uh, and we will start. Father, we, uh, we thank you for, uh, as always, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the promises you've given that accompany your word, that you are faithful uh, to bless it. And, and you've said uh, in this particular letter, there's a blessing in, in uh, reading it out loud. And so um, we trust that you will be present with us by your spirit, that you will be uh, instructing us and teaching us and growing us, uh, even if we don't uh, understand, even if we don't sense it. Uh, We know that you have promised to do it. And so we cling to that as we dive into this text. We ask that you would give us understanding. I pray that you would help me to speak the truth and that uh, that the result would be worship to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. We are diving in. This evening, I do not have a 20-minute intro like Rustin did last week, right? (laughs) Sorry. So, just a couple things to remind you of as we, as we dive in. We looked at chapter 17 last week, which Rustin preached on, and we saw more images. We saw beasts and harlots and prostitutes and all this crazy stuff. And uh, as is sometimes the case, John does not uh, leave the interpretation to our imagination. He actually tells us exactly what those things mean, so we don't have to guess. We know because he speaks them. And so we had this image, uh, this big picture image of Rome, which is the beast, and there's this woman harlot, Jerusalem and and or in Israel, and they have teamed together to make war on the saints. That is to declare war uh, on the church. Now, there's a there's just a, a one sentence that John throws in there at the end of chapter 17, and he mentions that. It happens to be that the Lamb is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, and declaring war on his people is a really bad idea. It doesn't go well. And so the plan to destroy the church uh, really, really backfires, and um, then something else happens. So in verse 16, it says, and the 10 horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire So you have Israel and Rome together declaring war on the church. It doesn't go well. And so Rome declares war on the harlot. That is Jerusalem. So that is where uh, chapter 17 leaves off. And then chapter 18 takes that theme and just expands it. It goes into all the details of what does it look like for the beast to declare war on the harlot. And what you're going to see as we go through this is there's a number of speakers, um, people who are proclaiming things in Revelation 18. So we'll kind of follow uh, that as a general outline. So we'll begin by looking at the first uh, three verses together. It says, After this I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living." All right, so we're confronted with an angel, a big, great, powerful angel, a bright angel who speaks with authority. Who is the angel? We don't know. It's a great angel. Some people think it's Jesus. Other people think it's just a great angel. John calls it a great angel, so we're going to go with that for now. And this angel has something to proclaim. The angel declares that fallen, that Babylon the Great has fallen, okay? Now, there's something happening that's been going, it's going on throughout the book of Revelation, and that is that John is taking Old Testament cities and nations that were subject to uh, uh, punishment and judgment, and he's applying those words now to Jerusalem. So we have in this declaration, fallen is Babylon, there is a, a double judgment, if you will, to call God's people Babylon, 
was to refer to them as a place of captivity and a place of judgment. It was to call Jerusalem an unfaithful bride, which again is, uh, is accurate for revelation language that refers to the harlot and the prostitute. And so not only is there a judgment in terms of calling Jerusalem Babylon and referring to her as the harlot, but this angel goes into the condition of this once beautiful, glorious city. Specifically, the angel identifies that it has become a place for demons and a place for unclean spirits. And then it goes on to list a number of unclean animals as well. So that the comment about this place becoming a haunt or a home or a place for demons and unclean spirits is, is really important because Jesus said this was going to happen. It's not, it's not a surprise. It's not a new thing. He actually talked about this in Matthew chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. It says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless paces seeking rest. By the way, that's really interesting. I wonder what does that mean? I don't know. It's very interesting though. But it finds none. And then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. And then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. Now, hold on just right there, okay? If you stop right there, what you think Jesus is talking about is an individual person who was dealing with demonic oppression. And we know from the Gospels that Jesus had a ministry of freeing people from demonic oppression. And so this sounds like Jesus is talking about a person who is dealing with some sort of uh, demonic harassment. However, that's not at all what Jesus is talking about because he explains himself in the next sentence. So also will it be with this evil generation. So Jesus is not talking about an individual person. He's not talking about the demoniac that was, uh, that was chained up and, and uh, hurting himself. He's talking about a generation, a particular group of people, those who were present. He is talking about Pharisees and the religious rulers. So he says, this is going to happen with this generation. Well, a generation is about a 40-year span of time. So in the next 40 years or so, Jesus says a bunch of demons are going to come back and are going to inhabit this place. Even think about um, Jesus's cleansing of the temple. He went through, he turns over the tables, he has harsh words to speak. We know um, that he cleanses that, te that temple. Jesus was cleansing the land of, of demons by casting demons out of people. But he's saying this land, this house that he had cleaned is going to be inhabited not by just one demon who returns, but a demon who brings seven worse demons with him, and you're going to have a whole houseful of demons. And again, he wasn't talking about an individual. He was talking about a generation. He was talking about a particular people. And here we see in Revelation, that's what's happened. This great city has become a dwelling place for demons. It has become a haunt for every unclean spirit. You remember earlier in, in uh, Revelation, Jesus referred to the synagogue as the synagogue of Satan. And he was talking about Jews who are not true Jews, Jews who had rejected the Jewish Messiah. They are a synagogue of Satan. It's interesting to note that in Mark's gospel, the first, um, first place that Jesus shows up after being in the wilderness, I think this is in chapter one or very early in chapter two, he goes to the synagogue. And what does he encounter at the synagogue? You guys remember? An unclean spirit. An unclean spirit is present and he has to cast the unclean spirit out. All of that is, is indicative of the condition of Israel, the condition of the house of instruction and worship. And Jesus is going in his ministry and cleaning it up, but he says, more are going to come, right? More are going to come in this generation. That reference, this generation, is, is uh, quite important as we're looking at the book of Revelation and the things that Jesus prophesied that are taking place in the book of Revelation. In Matthew 24, 
uh, which is Jesus' extensive dealing with the, the coming destruction of the temple, as he's talking about all these things that are going to happen, in verse 34, he says, Truly I say to you, this generation, it's the same group, this generation will not, pa- will not pass away until all these things take place. So we have judgment coming, we have the temple being destroyed, you have demons coming, exponentially more demons are coming to occupy um, this place. So Jesus says that generation would experience this, they would witness this, and in fact, they did. Um, If you've been reading the book that we have recommended to kind of, it's a primer on Revelation. It's not a exposition of Revelation as a whole, but it's a more of how do you approach the book of Revelation. Uh, You'll know that um, these texts from Matthew are really instructive in shaping how we approach the book of Revelation in terms of what the focus is, what is, what is John talking about, and also the timing of it is. When, when is John talking uh, about? And of course, Jesus says, this generation. So you have here, John uh, is recording this angel. The angel has looked upon the city, and the city that was once vibrant and glowing and full of commerce now it's the word that he's going to use is desolate, and it's become a place for demons. And that was going to happen, of course, in the generation. So one of the things that you want to notice as we're in 18 is that it's, it's as if the vantage point has changed a little bit. So before chapter 18, we're getting visions of things that are coming, and it's as if we're seeing them Come, these judgments, these plagues, these vials, the horsemen. It's like you're seeing the judgments come. But you'll notice in chapter 18, it's like we're on the other side. The judgments have come, and now we're seeing what was left after the judgments had been executed. So the angel gives this decree, Babylon, this great city, it has fallen. It has become a house, a haunt for demons and unclean spirits and all sorts of other unclean things. So that is a a declaration of God's judgment uh, on that generation, on that great city. Now you get to verse four and we have another speaker. We have another voice that is talking. It says, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds, mix a double portion for her in the cups she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning." Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. So we go from the great angel to now another voice that is speaking. And what's interesting about this voice is that this voice is not directed to Israel, And this voice is not directed to Rome. The voice is not directed to the world. This voice is directed to the church. God is addressing his people, the church. And the word that he speaks to them is get out, right? The city is going to be judged. Get out. Come out of her, my people. So essentially, the voice is saying it's time to leave. And the leaving has two parts to it. There's a geographical part to this, like get out of the city because it's about to get very, very heavy and serious. But there's also a getting out of a, a way, getting out of a, an ethos, getting out of a way of life when it says, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in what? In her sins. So you can leave Jerusalem and still act like Jerusalem right? So it's not enough to get out. You need to get out, but you also need to remove yourself from uh, a corruption and a way of life. So there's a geographical uh, element to this, and there's also this spiritual element, get away from the sin. So there are a couple things we want to notice about this. Um, When the voice says get out, 
again, it, it, it is repeating the instruction that Jesus gave to his own disciples regarding the destruction of the temple. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the temple being destroyed. He talks about wars and rumors of wars and famine and earthquakes and all of these kind of these uh, birth pains that are going to lead up to this moment. But he says, don't worry about that. The, the end, that judgment hasn't come yet. But then he says, something's going to happen. And that's when you need to run. And he actually tells them that they are to leave the city. And so in verse 15 and 16, it says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So you don't need to leave until this thing happens. And when this thing happens, then Jesus instructs his disciples, his church to leave. So the, the sign that indicates that they are to leave is the abomination of desolation. And it's funny how Jesus says, uh, or it says, let the reader understand, right? And, and what the author is saying is like, do the math. You know what we're saying here, right? It's just like, just like when John talks about the number of the beasts is 666. Like, let them understand. So we have this, this clue that we're supposed to think about what is the, uh, the abomination of desolation. He expects us to do the math. Well, um, that phrase is taken from the book of Daniel. It's used four times there. It's used in, in chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, and in chapter 12. In chapter 11, we read these words. It says, forces from him... This is an, an invading king army. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. So Daniel's talking about an invading army that's going to come and they are going to basically ransack the temple and they are going to set up an image there and have a burnt offering and that is going to just... That is the abomination. That is the most vile thing you can do to the temple, okay? Now, Daniel is talking about an event that was going to be in his future. It was uh, referring to the Syrian king who, in fact, plundered the temple in 167 or 168 BC, somewhere in there. It was a, it was a massacre. They killed 40,000 Jews. They sacrificed a pig, which is the most unclean animal, right? They bought a, a, prig, a pig in, sacrificed the pig on the altar, and then they set up an image of the king and said that it was a manifestation of God and was, it was a declaration of God and was to be worshipped. So Daniel talks about that happening, of course, before it happens, and then, in fact, it did happen, and when Jesus talks to his disciples and said, the abomination of desolation, he goes, think about that. Something like that is going to happen. A foreign army is going to invade a temple. It's going to be desecrated. There's going to be false worship. That's the sign. When that happens, you need to get the heck uh, out of Judea. Well, we know that this, in fact, did happen again. It repeated itself with the Roman invasion that was led by Titus. Titus was the um, son of Vespasian. You may remember there was Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, and then Vespasian. And his son was the general that invaded uh, the temple. And Josephus records it. He says, The Romans, upon the flight of the seditious into the city... And upon the burning of the holy house itself, and of all the buildings lying round uh, about it, brought their ensigns to the temple, and set them over against its eastern gate, and there did they offer sacrifices to them. So here you have the Roman army, army invading Jerusalem, taking the temple, and setting up their own sacrifice and worship inside of it. That is the uh, abomination that brings desolation. So that is the moment that Jesus tells the disciples to get out because it's going to get really, really bad. Now, there's something else going on in this text as well because we'll notice that there's language being used here that has been used before, particularly language that was used regarding the judgment of Babylon. 
So in Isaiah chapter 47, and I'll read these uh, one after another so you can, you can see the language for yourself. In Isaiah, and again, this is a prophecy about the judgment of Babylon. Now, therefore, hear this, you lover of pleasures who sit securely, who say in your heart, I am, and there is no one beside me. I shall not sit as a widow or know the loss of children. And then you have more going on, and it's about judgment. And in Revelation 18, verse 7, as she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning, since in her heart she says, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. So John is using Old Testament language that was about Babylon, and he's using that language to speak about Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem is the new Babylon, Um, And that's one of the themes, like all these places of judgment, those words, Egypt, we'll look at Sodom um, and Babylon, those are now being applied to Jerusalem. You also want to step back and and go, this text is, is about judgment, right? A judgment that is coming. But in the middle of this judgment, God says, get out to his people, right? Get out, and this is a pattern that is, is repeated in the scriptures. You, you should be thinking about stories like Noah. Judgment is coming. It's going to come. So Noah builds an ark, and a flood is going to come. And Noah builds an ark, and then the flood comes. And God provides a way for Noah and his family to be spared. They get out of the flood, if you will. Think about Abraham's nephew, Lot, who is living in Sodom, a place of of rampant sexual immorality. And the Old Testament also speaks of it as a place of excessive wealth and disregard for the poor. So Lot is there, and God tells Abraham that he's going to judge it. So Abraham is praying, and judgment does come. But who gets pulled out? Lot is going to be pulled out of that, and his family and his wife, who doesn't do what God says and gets turned into a pillar of salt. But there's an, there's an exodus there. There's a God. God is bringing judgment, but he is pulling his people out. It's the same thing with the exodus story. Judgment is coming to Egypt with the Passover. What is happening? God is protecting his people from judgment that's going to come upon the land of Egypt and, and they are clinging to the promise of God. They are painting their doorposts with blood because that's what God told them to do. And then God is going to what? He's going to take them out. And Egypt is going to be judged. That pattern keeps repeating itself. So we are to think of this story um, like, like Noah and the flood, like Sodom and the destruction that came there, like Israel and Egypt and the rescue that took place. Here, Babylon is going to be destroyed, and God calls his people out, calls them into safety and into his salvation. Now, verse 9, and I think this is where things get, can get confusing. It says, And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning, and they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys their cargo anymore, cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is human souls. That's quite the list, isn't it? You could have just said a lot of stuff. But though all those are listed, then verse 14, the fruit for which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls. 
For in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. And all shipmasters and seafearing, <coughs> excuse me, seafearing men, sailors, and all those whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth. For in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. All right, we're going to dive into this. We are hearing the voices of kings, we're hearing the voices, the collective voices of merchants. We have shipmasters along with sea-fearing men. All talking about the destruction of this great city, this destruction of um, Jerusalem. It seems, at least initially, as if the destruction of this singular city has a disproportionate effect on the world, right? You're talking about one city with the kings and the merchants and the, sh- the seafaring men and, and uh, all these tradespeople, they're all mourning after this. Um, is, is this a disproportionate influence? And if so, how would we uh, explain it? And so I want to just, I'm not going st- to going to stand on this hill. I'm just going to acknowledge something that I think is interesting and then we'll go on to something else. Um, it does seem as if the Jewish people as, as, a, as a whole have a disproportionate effect on the world, right? That's just an objective stand, stand back and just notice some things. So a couple things for you to consider, okay? At one point in the Obama administration, 33% of the Supreme Court judges were Jews. Three. That's three out of nine. According to Forbes, at the same time, I don't know if it's the top 100 or top 50, I can't remember, but 50% of the top wealthiest people in our country, you want to guess their ethnicity? They were Jews, okay? So 33% of the Supreme Court, 50% of the wealthiest people in our country were Jews. Now consider that Jews make up 2.4% of the entire population of our country. That's profound. That is a disproportionate presence. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just acknowledging that is something that is is quite unique. Consider this. Approximately 25% of the Nobel Prizes have been awarded to what ethnicity? Jewish people. 25%. One in every four Nobel Prizes is given to a Jewish person. Now consider this, that Jews make up 0.19% of the world's population. That, there's something really peculiar and interesting about that. Is there any, any sort of biblical explanation for it? And I'm just speculating here. I just think it's interesting to think about. Um, God blessed this people for a global mission. He built them from nothing. He called them out. He makes very clear that he didn't love them because they were bigger than other nations. He says, actually, you're the smallest of all the nations. And what is he going to do with them? He's going to bless the nations. And through this peculiar group of people, they're going to be a light to the nations. This small group of people that are going to be uh, uh, surrounded in their history through people who want to attack them and hate them, they're not only going to survive, but God had given them a, a, a missional vocation of being a light, not to a neighboring community, but a light to all of the nations. Now, that is, that is a disproportionate influence. Can we acknowledge that? There's a disproportionate influence there. And perhaps... God has uniquely blessed this people uh, for that purpose, for that reason. And, and maybe we're seeing some of that uh, culturally as we look at wealth, as we look at education, as we look at Nobel Prizes and all that stuff. It, it could be 
uh, that God has just designed this small people to have a massive impact. And so we're seeing some of the, the implications of that. Like I said, I'm not dying on that hill. I just think it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that. Now, there's another way to think about this text as well. And that is to not read the kings and the merchants and the seafaring, not to, not to um, read that literally, but to read it in light of the way that John has used other images. So you remember, we went into great length to talk about when, when John talks about the stars and the sky and the constellations falling, right? He's not talking about the planets falling. What's he talking about? Kings and leaders and nations. That is Old Testament language, not to refer to decreation, but it's, it's to refer to the fall of a nation or the judgment of a king or the fall of a people. Um, the, uh, something very similar could be going on in this text where he's not talking about the whole world here. He's talking about particular people. He's talking about influential, wealthy. Uh, he's talking about political power uh, within Jerusalem, part of that people, part of that system, if you will. He's talking about people who had directly benefited from the religious perversion that had become prevalent in and throughout Israel. He's referring to people who benefited from the moral corruption that was so pervasive uh, in the temple. You remember that Jesus had a fierce critique for the temple. When he showed up to the house of his father, right, he was not happy. He was not winsome. He was angry, and he turned over tables, and he had some things to say. There is, um, there's actually, I think, quite a bit of overlap between the goods, that long list of goods that we read uh, in Revelation, there's a, a lot of overlap between the things described there and the things that would be described uh, with the temple as well as with the priesthood. Let me read you a couple of sections from the book of Exodus. Exodus 28, verses 5 through 9. Just listen to all the things. These are the garments that, that shall be made. A breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. They shall receive gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. And they shall make an ephod of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twined linen, skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it and be of one piece with it, gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. And then in chapter 25, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall um, receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram's skins, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and stones for the settings, for the ephod, and for the breastpiece, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Now, you just notice there's a lot of things that are listed there, right? These are all things for adorning the temple, the, the, the place of worship, the place of sacrifice, and for adorning the priest as well. And many of the things that are listed in this text in Revelation, we find present in the temple for the decorating of it and for the clothing of the priest. But wait, there's more. I want you to think about Luke chapter 16 for a sec. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him, okay? So just pause right there for a moment. Let's keep the text. Um, he's talking about the love of money, and he's like, you cannot worship these two gods. 
And he's doing this on purpose, right? He knows that his audience loves money. And he's inviting them to repent. He's pointing out their sin, right? You can't do this. You can't play this game. You can't love both money and God. And Luke tells us that the Pharisees, right, they were in fact lovers of money and they knew exactly what Jesus was saying and they did not appreciate it very much. Now, after that, Jesus tells a story. And the story begins like this. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, you know, if you've, if you've been in the church for a while, you know the story. It's the rich man and who? Lazarus, right? And so Jesus tells the story. Both the rich man and Lazarus had died. They have gone to Abraham's bosom. That's where you go before death, resurrection, and ascension. Lazarus did not have a good life, but he was a righteous man. And so he goes uh, into Abraham's bosom, and it is a place of, of delight for him, right? He's not suffering. But this rich man who is clothed in purple and fine linen, who ate really well every day, he is awaiting judgment, and it's hot, and he's thirsty, and he wants a cup of water, and he's asking for people to go warn his family about what's going to go on, okay? Who is the rich man? The priests. He just talked to the Pharisees about their love of money, and then he tells a story. Here's a man dressed in fine purple linen. You know who was dressed in fine purple linen? The priests. The priests. So you can see there is a critique. Jesus was constantly critiquing the priesthood. He was constantly critiquing the way that the temple had been perverted. And the language is very sim similar. The language between how the uh, temple was was decorated, the goods that were gathered for it, the way that the priests were dressed, that is very similar to this list of goods that we have in Revelation 18. And so I think it's very likely that what, what is happening in Revelation 18 is not kings from all over the lands, but it is these, these, these power holders, it's the priesthood, it's the temple system, it's all of those who were benefiting from the corruption of, of the temple and worship and the corruption of Judaism. I think that's what he is talking about. And yeah, we can debate that. It's, it's interesting. But I think that's what he is talking about. So when we locate the, the people, this is, this is who is talking here. Because remember, we're, just, we're trying to figure out who's talking. Who are the merchants? Who are the kings? I think it's those people. But then you got to figure out, okay, what are we supposed to make of what they say? Listen to what they say. I'll read them for you. Revelation 18, 11. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. So question, why are they mourning? It seems like they're broke, right? They're like, hey, we can't, we can't sell this stuff anymore. If you made your money selling things in the temple for sacrifice and the temple got destroyed, guess what? You're done. <laughs> Okay, verse 15, the merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of torment, weeping and mourning aloud. So all we know is that they are really heartbroken over this. 17 through 19, and all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors and all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her, her wealth. For in a single hour, she has been laid waste. So you, you have again mourning, but you have this acknowledge like, hey, we all profited off of this. We all made money off of the corruption of the city and the city's no more. And so we cannot benefit anymore. So here's the question. This is what I ask. And, and I, I, I don't know the answer to it. I'm, I have a suggestion, but I don't know what the answer is. How are we supposed to hear the words of the kings and the merchants and the seafaring men? Are these just people who are complaining because they are going to take a financial hit off the destruction of the temple or is there a genuine mourning that God is bringing judgment on a people? Is it only self-interested mourning? Or 
Is there a, a genuine? No, they, they figured out what this means. Which is it? I'm curious really quick. What, 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 how many of you think it's genuine mourning? And it's okay, I don't know who's right and who's wrong. Genuine mourning. How many of you think it's this self, self-serving, self-interest, they, they don't, they're losing their money, okay? Okay. Oh, third way, Tim. <laughs> it could be both. It could be both. Okay. I, I, I'm going to honest, I don't know what the answer to it is. Um, Peter Lightheart, whose, whose commentary we've been following very closely, he makes an argument that what we're witnessing here is actually repentance. It's the beginning of repentance. And his argument is not because he believes the sincerity of the people who are saying these things. He bases the argument in the book of Revelation itself. He argues, uh, he looks at two different places. One is chapter one, verse seven. It says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Wail. That's mourning. That's lament. This is gonna happen. You have to be alive to lament and to mourn, right? Now, earlier, in the book of Revelation, when the judgments come like waves that are crashing, right? Do you remember when it says a third? God wiped out a third. So you have partial judgments, not total judgments. And God is slowly unrolling, if you will, these judgments on Jerusalem. And the book of Revelation says, and they did not repent. They did not give God glory. So we have a mourning that is supposed to happen that we have not seen happen yet in the book. Then in Revelation chapter 11, at that hour there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So there's two times in Revelation, only two times, where it indicates not just massive judgment, but there's going to be some lament and mourning and some sort of a turning. Lightheart argues that there's no other place in the book of Revelation where this is even possible outside of this chapter. This is the only time we have any potential indication that you actually have lament, that you actually have mourning. Um, So I don't know I do not know what the answer is. Um, I'd like to think that he's right, but I don't know, okay? Now, we're gonna dive into the next section. This is the final section of the book, or the final section of the chapter. The final section of the book. Don't we wish? Uh, 21 through 24. It says, Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft uh, will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. For your merchants were the great ones of the earth. All of nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth earth. All right. When you hear the final uh, announcement in chapter 18, you have this large stone being thrown into the sea. A large stone, something like a large stone, like a mountain being thrown into the sea. You should be going, wait, we've heard that before, right? Somebody's talked about mountains being thrown into seas before, haven't they? Somebody? Somebody named Jesus? Matthew 21, Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done, uh, has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. So Jesus, immediately um, before this, he had cursed a fig tree. The, the tree had not produced the fruit it was supposed to, and so he curses the tree, 
Um, and of course, that happened after. You guys know what happened right before that? Sorry. The temple's cleansed. The tree is cursed. Those are the same thing. And he says, hey, with faith, you can, you can throw this mountain into the sea. What mountain was Jesus talking about? Oh, the temple mount. You're going to throw the temple mount into the sea. Does that sound like Revelation? What's happening here? So you have this millstone. Babylon, the, the great city, will be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. He says, he took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea. We, we've talked about how the land is, is Revelation speak for, for, uh, for Jerusalem and the sea typically is the Gentiles. So here is the temple is going to be thrown into what? It's going to be thrown into the sea. It's going to be thrown into the Gentiles. That means judgment. And John goes into what that judgment looks like. Um, there is mass violence. There is massive destruction. There are no more, no, more, uh, no more coffee shops. There's no more tradesmen. There's no more merchants. There's no more crafts. The light has been taken out of the lamp. There's no more celebrating. There's no more weddings. There's no more good music. There's no more anything. This is what is going to happen. I think that this, uh, this verse is, or this section of verses is perhaps one of the most compelling verses um, that supports the, the position or the approach that we have taken to understanding the book of Revelation, which is a preterist approach, meaning John is talking not about our future. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about events that were going to take place in the immediate future of his initial audience, things that would have taken place within the generation that Jesus spoke to when he talked about these things, that these things were going to happen to them. I think that this is one of the most compelling uh, verses for that, and also understanding that Babylon that is being judged is, in fact, Jerusalem. And the reason for that is, is chapter, or sorry, is verse 24. It says, in her, this is in Babylon, Okay? Remember, that's the language. Babylon has been casted. Babylon has fallen. Babylon has been given over to judgment. In her, that is in Babylon, was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. So Babylon is the place where the blood of the prophets, all of the prophets, is. Babylon is the place where the blood of the saints is. Well, where is the place of the blood of the prophets? Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 23. He says, Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. He goes on to say, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. I don't know how you read that and read Revelation 18 and not, and not see this, this is this, is, this has happened. Jesus said this was going to happen. Jerusalem is the place where the blood of the prophets is at. And it's the place where the blood of, of all the earth is going to uh, find its judgment. It is, the, it is the new Babylon, if you will. I don't, I don't know how, I can't, I can't wiggle my way out of that. So it's left off, Jesus says, you are... Uh, your house is left to you desolate. And that is the one statement that probably most succinctly describes what's happening in chapter 18. The city, this great, beautiful, glorious city, has been utterly destroyed. It is now a place, a haunt for demons, for every unclean bird and animal. There's judgment being poured out on it. The ramifications are absolutely far-reaching. 
There is a judgment on the perversion of the temple and the priesthood and the wealth and the manipulation and the greed. All of that, there's a massive judgment. And what is left at the end is this place that continually killed the prophets. Um, Your house is left to you desolate. That's it. So one pastor summed it up this way. He said, just as Israel, as old Israel, was delivered from old Babylon, so also will the new Israel be delivered from the new Babylon. That means that even in in Jerusalem, what in Israel had become like Babylon, God is still saving his people. He still called his people out. He still spared his church. All right, so we're actually on time. This is crazy. Um, a couple of things to kind of, of take away from this chapter, big ideas. God is clearly patient, right? We've seen God's patience demonstrated throughout Revelation where God sends warning and God sends a temporary judgment, but he is restrained in that judgment. So God is patient, but we ought not to confuse God's patience as a never-ending thing. His patience does eventually run out. And we go from third, a third judgment to a great city that is left desolate. What happens? I remember, I think it was uh, one pastor said, God has a very, 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 very slow fuse and a very, very, very big explosion. God is incredibly patient, but he's not patient forever. There comes a time. Second, God protects his people. God always protects his people. Jesus warned the disciples before, hey, when you see the abomination of desolation, get the heck out of there. Like, you need to leave Judea when that happens. You see God throughout redemptive, uh, throughout the scriptures, God is pulling his people out right? The flood's coming. He's pulling his people out. You have Egypt. God is pulling his people out. There's going to be destruction of of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is pulling his people out. So God protects his people. He always protects his people. In verse 20, this is the refrain of those, of, um, I think this is the the sea-fearing men, It says, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment uh, for you against her. That's one of the reasons I think that the lament may be genuine, because there's a sense in which they understand what's happening. But I want you to listen to those words, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Rejoice over over the destruction of the great city. We think of of, um, God's attributes like his love and his grace and his mercy, and those are the things that we proclaim, and those are the things that we love, and those are the things that we worship him for, and we ought to worship worship him for those things. But one of the challenges of Revelation is that there's not a reluctancy in Revelation to worship and adore God for his judgments. Even when those judgments are the the destruction, the desolation of a city. We do not worship God because he's the way we want him to be. We worship God because he's God. And so that includes his justice and his wrath. And lastly... Uh, we can rest assured that God will vindicate his people and he will execute judgment for all of our suffering. Jerusalem was the place that killed the prophets. The prophets were God's servants. He sent them to preach repentance and they didn't want to hear them and so they killed them and they killed them and they killed them. We know that the first century was a bloody century for the church, that many, many Christians shed their blood for their witness. But God calls his people out, and the judgment that was poured out on Jerusalem was because Jerusalem had shed the blood of the prophets. You see how God is vindicating his servants? Jerusalem sheds the blood of his prophets, and they shed the blood, and they shed the blood, but there comes a time where God says no more, and he vindicates his prophets who had been ignored. 
He vindicates his people, and he also executes judgment for, um, for the wrongs that they had endured. So God will vindicate his people. God will vindicate you. If you are mocked, if you are ridiculed, if you are shamed, if you are whatever, God will vindicate you. And when we suffer injustice or when we suffer whatever, we know that God is judge and God will pour out um, judgment according to uh, his wisdom for those things. God pours out judgment even on behalf of those who are, are dead, right? So, so there's this, this, this satisfaction that we should, we should have. No matter what happens, God is the judge. God will make things right. We can trust him with that. Okay, questions? Nobody? No. Dane? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes, I would agree with that statement. Yeah, so, there is I so. Some people tell me like the wrong thing. They'll say, "Oh no, all of Israel, all these Jews, like uh, biological, like you know, by lineage, they're all going to be saved." Mm-hmm. They'll always point to this story. Yeah. So in, in Romans, so I, I would agree with you. I believe, um, I believe that, the, that the, the church is the fulfillment of what Israel was so supposed to be. Israel is those who, who have the faith of Abraham, is according to Romans 9, right? So when he says, all who are of Israel are not true Israel. Just because Abraham's your father doesn't mean you have the faith of Abraham, right? And so true Israel has the faith of Abraham. True Israel puts their faith in Christ. And God is, in Ephesians 2, taking out of the Gentiles and the Jew and making one new man, not two different men with two different plans for salvation, but one new man who's united to God in Christ and united with each other. So I think that um, if you want to say new Israel or true Israel, and I think those, those are accurate ways of speaking of the church. That's how Paul speaks of the church at the end of Galatians. The true Israel of God. That's the church. It's the true Israel of God. So I would agree, I would agree with what you're saying. Okay. Any other questions? Going once. The questions in the front row. No, not a single one? Nope? Okay. All right, let me pray, and uh, we will, and it's a miracle, we'll be done on time. Father God, we thank you again for, um, uh, for your word, and we, uh, we praise you for being a God who is patient. We praise you for being a God who uh, also judges, and we... Um, we know your judgments are good. They are true. And so we give you glory for what you have done. And Father, we pray as, as we see uh, your faithfulness and your power uh, demonstrated through, uh, through this study that you would give us a growing faith and confidence in you, especially as, as uh, man, it just feels like everything's gone crazy. And, uh, but you are not crazy. And you are good, and you are true. So, Lord, grow our faith and our trust in you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'll be up here if you guys have other questions you didn't want to ask publicly.